We're going to start this morning, my message is digging deeper, and we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 22. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, now take now your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Amen. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hands on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. And since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord Will Provide, or Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do praise you and thank you today. I give you glory for your awesome goodness and for our, uh, all that you've already done today. But I pray that today that our word that we are breaking together will nourish us, fill us, and be used by us. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I think many of us are familiar with this passage. We know that Abraham went there. He went in faith. How many of us could do it? I don't know. Honestly, to take your only child. And, and, and I like the fact he says in verse number two, take your son, your only son, Isaac, which is an interesting phrase because we know he already has Ishmael. But he says your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And the word only son there is one word in the Hebrew. It's your kid. Take your kid up to the, <laughs> up there and get him sacrificed. But anyway. <laughs> oh. It describes Abraham's unique miracle child. Now, Zechariah also says something about this in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2. 10, listen to what he says here. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Who's that? Jesus. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And we know all the symbolism and the types and the shadows going on here. We know that Abraham was called by God to show how faithful and how much trust he had by taking his only begotten son that he loved, his miracle son, not the one that he had with Hagar. That wasn't a miracle. Anybody can, you know, have a kid with a young slave girl, even though he was quite old. I mean, Tony Randall did it, so if he can do it, anybody could. Amen. But... uh won't go there. We can talk about that later. But anyway, you uh, you can be amazed sometimes about what God can do. It's when you're amazed by what God has done, and then it seems like you're called to sacrifice that, to give that up. 
you have the perfect job, but for some reason you feel like God saying it's time to move on. Amen. You can have things happen and just be, man, everything's flowing along great. You don't want any changes. This is too good. This is God. But God's saying, Abraham, load up your whole family and get out of Ur. Get out of her, here, her, here. Go over there. So he went over to Canaan and everywhere he went. Abraham, to me, had already proven his trust. How many he had? He had already proven that he trusted God. But there's still another test, still another, another thing that he had. How many know that obedience doesn't stop just because you get saved? Amen? Obedience just starts because that's the first step of obedience, asking Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. That's your first step. Now, he may never ask you to give up your kid. Hallelujah. He's not, he didn't need to ask anybody else that. Why? Because he gave up his only begotten son. He gave up the Lamb of God, his child for you and me, so that we would have access to be obedient ourselves. I mean, before that, we could have tried to live according to the law, which didn't work out. You can read the Bible and... You know, you can see that that doesn't work a whole real good without the Spirit of God helping you. Now, instead of trying to live according to the letter of the law, through the Spirit of the law, we, or through the, through the power of the Spirit, we can keep the law. I don't have to do the things that the Ten Commandments said don't do. And Jesus boiled those down into two. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love the Lord thy God with all thy spirit, soul, and body, and love thy neighbor as thyself. When Isaac was going up that hill you know today's message actually is about Isaac more than it is anything else because Isaac can kind of get a bad rap he was he was in between Abraham the father of our faith and Jacob who became Israel who had the 12 sons who were going to inherit the you know who are going to be setting up in in heaven and have gates named after him and all that think about that Isaac you know, if we talked about all the stuff we remember about Isaac, it's not as, you know, he, he did a lot of the same things that Abraham did, honestly. Uh, got a wife at a well. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a lot of, lot of similarities in some of the things that they did. And we're going to look a little bit at that. But I heard a message a long time ago, and I mentioned this probably last week. And it was written in a book called Pentecostals in Crisis by Ron Ock. And what he said in there was that Isaac uh, didn't have a name to uh, claim to fame because he redug Abraham's wells and he should have been digging his own. What we're going to see today, that's not even correct. Because I had heard that. And and when I read his book, I was like, wow, yeah. Well, I got the idea of what he was saying. How many of you know I can't live off of Dean's revelation? I can't, I ain't going to get saved by what Tina knows. Nobody would, actually. But anyway, hallelujah. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> you only pick on people that'll take it, amen? You only pick on the people that don't. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I'm digging deeper. <laughs> Look, you have to have a relationship of your own with Jesus Christ. You have to understand what we heard this morning, that he is our Savior, but he's also our healer, our deliverer. He, he wants to be our constant companion and friend, and we need to repent of the fact that we give him a portion and not everything. Abraham was willing to give his miracle child. What are you willing to give? What can you give up? What, how will you live to, to show that you're willing now i'm not certain it says here how old isaac was i didn't look that up but he was old enough to know they didn't have a lamb he was old enough to trust his dad that there was going to be a lamb he was old enough not to run off when his dad tied him down <laughs> tried to tie him down onto the altar i mean i would have been getting a little squirrely about then i don't know about you 
If my dad had tied me up at any point, I'd have probably gotten a little, you know. It wouldn't have been too much fun around the house. Isaac had a lot more trust than what we might think. Go over to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, verse number 2. Then the Lord appeared to him, and this is talking about Isaac, and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Oh, he's telling him where to go, just like he told Daddy. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. The same promise that he made to Abraham, he made to Isaac. He swore to him. And that means to completely bind oneself to fulfilling an oath. God was going to do this. Isaac's descendants were going to have this land. Just like he had told Abraham, he told him this is going to happen. And he says, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. You know, whenever you hear that, you immediately think of Abraham. But this is, he's speaking to Isaac here. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Let me ask you this. How's the nation of the United States going to get blessed? Well, if you don't, you don't get blessed. I know that. It doesn't go good for you. But no, what I was thinking was through our seed. If we don't pass on what we get, if the blessings and the promises that you and I receive aren't ministered unto, spoken about, and given to the next generation, it doesn't go any further. If you go to Europe right now, there's nobody serving God because at some point they stop passing it on. They stop sowing the seeds into the young ones. I mean, we got more of a purpose than just coming in here and worshiping God. We've got to see that those kids over there get blessed and that they receive the promises of God just like we have and that they understand the things like we heard this morning belong to them just like they do us. And God will speak to them just like he has us. Amen? we got a couple of young people and a teenager and an adult getting baptized next week. We're doing that at the beginning of the service because we've got a lot to do that day. So we're going to start out with that probably after the first song, somewhere in there. And uh, we're going to let Fred go first because he plays on the worship team. So we want him to get changed to get back up there before we get too far along. But uh, we, uh, we, have a, we have a responsibility to pass the things along that we've had to people coming behind us. You can lose your Christian foothold in a generation. And I got to tell you now, we've been losing steps. If you compare our nation the way we was after World War II to where we are now, we've went a long way away from God. Amen. Now, some people are still serving God and worshiping God and praise God for that. I, there will always be a remnant. But I don't want to be a remnant. Amen? I want to be a majority. I don't care that people call me the moral majority like they were in the 70s and 80s or whatever, whenever that was. I want to be in the majority for real. I'm not talking a political thing. I'm talking a spiritual thing. I want to see us seeing people saved. We didn't do very good last year salvation-wise as far as the church goes. Worst year I've ever seen in the whole time that we've been doing it. We were down and we didn't baptize anybody last year. Now, we could have. It's just that things didn't work out. The, uh, the pond got overflowed. The, the someone was going to do that one. The other one didn't get promoted correctly in the fall like we usually do, so we didn't let anybody know that we were thinking about doing it. That was my fault. Uh, if anybody was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I, couldn't, I didn't write it down, I, I, so I don't remember if anybody was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we were down in finances big time, which we're going to share next, next week. 
I already feel we're going up this year. Amen. We've already seen a salvation. We're getting ready to have water baptisms where, you know, I feel like we're going up. I feel like there's going to be some people get filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of times we're afraid of what God wants to do. (laughs) It's like you think God's going to tie you down to the altar. The truth is you're really going to be set free. Amen. And the power of God's going to help you do that. He goes on to say here, I'll back up. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Isaac went where God told him to go. Amen. Now move on down. You can read all about Abimelech, Abimelech and him, and have a bunch of talks and stuff. Go down to verse 15. It says, Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells, which his servants, father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So God so blessed Isaac where he went, <laughs> that the neighbors who let him come in there without having a fuss, now they're saying, wow, you got too much stuff. It's kind of like a lot in Abraham, and they had, to, they had to get away from each other. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek because they quarreled with him. Or, basically, that means quarrel. That was the name of that well. Then they dug another well, and they also quarreled over that one. So he calls it name Sitna, which means enmity. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, meaning spaciousness, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So Isaac dug wells, but not without a fight. He redug the wells of his father. And we can think about that in a type also, because how many of you know we stand on the shoulders of those who was before us? If somebody hadn't been passing along the Christian message, we'd have never got it. Now, maybe it wasn't our parents, and maybe somebody else ministered it to us, but they got it from somewhere, who got it from somewhere, and it came here with whoever, pilgrims, Puritans, all those people. Now, here's the thing. We got it. They got it. We need to redig the old wells. But you don't live according and only on the old wells. you got to dig your own wells. And that's what Isaac did. He dug wells. He called it spaciousness because now he had room to be fruitful. I want to get free to the point that I got the room to be fruitful. Amen? How many want to be fruitful? Amen? Hallelujah. And if we do what we know, we have been taught, and we teach that to the next generation, then we can pass along to them the ability to also serve God, know God, and be fruitful. But we've got to dig some of our own wells. Let's go ahead and try to decide whether I want to read the rest of that or not. Let's just not read any more of that. So what do we need to do to see this accomplished? How are we going to see it passed along? How are we going to accomplish the idea that we are a generational-minded people and not a bless-us-now kind of people? There are a lot of people who like the blessings now. You know, back in the old days, here's what I used to hear. 
I don't understand why we have this children's church. Well, back when I was young, I made my kids sit right there in that pew. And if they made any kind of noise, I smacked them. Smacking. Okay. <laughs> Illustrated sermon. <laughs> The thinking was, if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for them. And it could be, depending on where you're at, depending on who's doing the service, depending on what's happening. Uh, kids get a lot more out of a service than what they seem like they do. I'll say that. They can sit in a church, and, and they'll hear things, and later on they'll mention them and talk about them. But I think that when we make it on their level, they receive it more because they're receiving something that they can understand and get behind. There's a lot more illustrations used. And most of you in here, even you in here, receive more than just hearing. You receive by sight as well. Amen? And there's other ways of receiving. But a lot of people are more visually stimulated and receive more through the vision than they do through the ear. Amen? Amen? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I, Cheryl, Pastor Cheryl and I have done devotions, you know, at different times. And usually one of us would read and the other one would sit there. <laughs> if I'm not reading it, I'm not getting it. Hearing it doesn't do it. Now, I'm not saying that if I was driving down the road and I had a scriptures on or something or some guy's preaching, I couldn't receive from that. I could. I can. But just for a general rule, I want to read it myself. I'm a Berean. i got to get it out and search it and read it myself. Amen? Some of you are the same way. We've got to be able to provide for those kids what they need. Or they're not going to become soldiers for the Lord. I don't know if you all realize it, but he got away from the, from the Christmas scene and ended up up here. Hallelujah. He's, he's, he's on the march. He's moving on up. We all need to. What do we need to do? A, offer yourself completely to God. You can say Abraham offered Isaac. Okay, we offer them too. Amen. Samuel's mom offered Samuel. We got to offer our kids. You know, sometimes we, we don't want our kids doing what God wants them to do what they're called to do. We want to hold them back because, ooh, ha, I don't want them moving away. Or I don't want them, man, I've seen what pastor's kids go through. Yeah, and we all have. Look what happens to them. Anyway, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. I never understood that exactly, but I do. I know in some churches you got mean people. And for some reason they don't treat the pastor right, and if they don't teach the teach the pastor right they don't his kids either or the kids see the pastor in the way he's getting treated and the problems and all that you know if we've ever had a problem we never talked about it in front of our kids anyway and you shouldn't either you know your kids aren't aren't able to handle the burdens of of your life and the things that you're going through and the problems that you have and they don't want to i mean they hear about your finances and you know you haven't got money to buy food for their ducks you know, that's, that's not what they want to hear. Yeah, I know. A lot of duck owners in here. But anyway, oh, yeah, that's right. Well, I've, seen, I've seen the pictures, so, so uh, eggs and everything. Hallelujah. <laughs> Kids don't need that. What they need to know is that we have a God that provides. What they need to hear is our victories and our testimonies and what God's doing in our lives. They need to hear the good news. They don't need to hear the bad news. That's why we have good news clubs at the schools. You know, we support the lady who's over the whole southeast Indiana area of the good news clubs. Bridget back from down, at, down in for sales for friendship area. And they have clubs, and she's been instrumental in getting clubs in almost every school in this entire area, every grade school. They've got a good news club after school. It's legal, and the people go in and preach the gospel to these young people. That's a worthy cause right there because some of these kids aren't going to be taken to church by their parents, but the parents will just as soon leave them at church than pick them up and get a snack at at the church instead of, 
you know, hey, I hope that works for us. I hope there's families in the community say, I'm going to drop my kids off for breakfast and go back to bed. Hey, we got their kids. Amen. I mean, I hope they, they come to church, but I'll tell you something that I noticed over the years. I noticed it in our teen ministry. If kids came from the community and we want them to, and we try to get them and we want them to come in, if they come from the community and their parents never get in church, they don't stay in church either. And it's hard enough with all the things that kids have to do, all the things that, that, that teenagers especially, because, hey, they're going to get a driver's license, and you get a driver's license, you get a job because you want to pay for your own gas and your Tootsie Rolls, whatever. And then, and then you know, they got the job, and, and their job's always going to be when they can't go to church. I heard a testimony of somebody just today who told me that they weren't going to take a job just because they didn't want to miss church. I praise God for that. Amen? Got off point, sorry. I went to preaching. We got to give ourselves completely to God. We need to trust God like Abraham did. We need to trust God like Isaac did. Uh oh, I just killed our soldier. He he fell into the abyss down in the crack in the world down here. Uh oh, you're the one that did it. <laughs> Hallelujah. We got to trust God. We got to trust him. B, we trust God at his word, which is the same point. Actually, I moved into that point before I got to it. <laughs> how many know God speaks to you and he tells you things? But how many know he also speaks to us through his word, the written word? He can speak to me and tell me to do stuff. He can speak to me through his word and tell me what I need to do or not do. If he tells me something that doesn't line up with his written word, it's wrong. If he tells me to come off here and slap Dean upside the head, well, we'll have to look that one up. <laughs> Ask the scholars in here what they think, but uh, yeah, most definitely do it. Okay. <laughs> Andy, I, Andy, I said scholars. I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> hallelujah. We, uh, I mean, I knew a pastor. I had a pastor tell me one time that this this couple come into the church. They weren't married but they both sang on the worship team and they were both married to someone else and they came in and said, we feel like the Lord's telling us we're supposed to divorce our spouses and marry each other so we can go into a traveling singing ministry. And he said, Nyeh. nope, that ain't right. How many know that ain't right? Amen. I've known at least two women that left their husbands with the kids to go into some kind of a singing thing. Wasn't a ministry. They wanted to be country singers or something. How I many know oh, they're still not famous? That doesn't work. C, listen to God when he speaks. Oh, yeah, obey his voice. How I many know that when Isaac heard what God told him, he did what he was told? I, ca I got to trust God. You have to trust God to obey God, to listen to what he's saying. So you've got to kind of start with the trust, but then you've got to do it. I can say I believe God and I trust God all I want and never get up off my uh, chair. Right? I might never do what God's told me to do. The blessing of obedience blesses your family. It does. I believe Isaiah said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Or was that Samuel? Yeah, that was Samuel. Got my prophets mixed up there. How many of you want your families blessed? 
How many you can say, well, my, my kids are grown and gone. Well, they still need blessed. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And those grandkids need blessed. They need to be ministered to as well. My last thought this morning, redig the old wells and dig new ones too. Look, you got to dig a little deeper, dig a little deeper, 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 dig a little deeper. See, if you go out of here singing that song today, <laughs> I'm going to laugh. But anyway, <laughs> we got to dig deeper ourselves. We've got to have a relationship with God. Yes, I can read what, you know, men of God of the past have said. I can read, you know, the definitions that I gave on some of the words this morning came from Strong's Concordance. I actually have those in my Bible, those words. That's why I like this Bible, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. They're hard to get now. Uh, They're not putting them out like they used to. It has all kinds of articles in it by all kinds of full gospel Pentecostal guys. Awesome. But it's got, I mean, you'd be reading right along and there'd be an article right there explaining that a little bit about what you just read. Or there's a word in there. And I know some of you got those Bibles, but I can, I can get out of that. I can redig what they say. I've been reading a couple of devotionals this year along with my regular devotions. I've been reading something with, by Rick Renner. I've been reading something by Watchman Nee. So if I quote those guys this year, it's why. I already have a couple times because, man, what they said went right along with what I was getting ready to preach anyway. Worked right in there. But I can dig I can dig it. You know what I'm saying? Dig a little deeper, deeper, deeper. Dig a little deeper, deeper, deeper. Anyway, we also need to dig our own wells, though. I need to get in this word and dig and see what he's saying to me. I got to get in here and see what he's saying to you when I'm getting ready to preach. Some of you are called to preach. If you're not digging, you're not going to have anything to give. And you can strike gold. I heard years ago, and this has this is good for the listening part when you come to church. A guy told me years ago, he comes to a service. He just tries to, he can't remember the whole thing. He tries to walk out with a couple of nuggets in his pocket. And that's what he hangs on to, and that's what he lives with. What difference does it make if you do this or not? may not seem like it makes a difference to you at all, but it will make a world of difference to those young people over in that other room, to your family that maybe isn't here and couldn't be here anyway because they live out of state or whatever. It will make a difference because you walk in the blessings of God, testifying of his goodness, You're so blessed that the enemy goes, move a little further away from me. And you got spaciousness to be fruitful. I want to be fruitful. That's what difference it makes. How many of you want to get deeper with God? If you do, stand to your feet. I know you're going the wrong direction. I should have had you get on your knees, go down, dig a little deeper there. I dig a hole for myself every Sunday morning. Uh, I got to get out of the one I dug for Tina. and the one I, I almost always have one. You know what happened? I usually throw it at her, but it went past her today. It went past Pastor Cheryl and hit Tina. <laughs> you didn't dig it? Oh, she could take it. All right, she could dig it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Far out. Groovy. <laughs> you were with me, wasn't you? We went, we went, Thomas, <laughs> never mind. I ain't telling that story. Anyway, bow your heads. Thank you, Lord. Father, I do praise you and thank you that we can be a people that go deeper with you. Lord, I thank you for those people who've been before us and the words that we've heard. I thank you for the prophecies we've heard and the things that have been placed within us. And I pray that we would mind those things, that we'd go deeper into the things of God. I pray, Lord, that we go deep in the things that we've heard from our fathers, from the men of God that have gone before us, from those, those, uh, those pastors and ministers who wrote books and do things and from the testimonies of people that we hear and read about. 
I thank you for the faith that can come from that, like hearing about Smith Wigglesworth and some of his exploits, and and we just we just get encouraged when we do that. But I thank you that we'll dig and get deep on our own. I thank you that the water level rise up. I thank you for it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Let us dig our wells, Lord. Let them be wells of salvation. Let them be wells of healing. Let them be wells of, of deliverance in our lives and to everyone that comes to drink as we provide for them. Cool living water. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Don't go anywhere. Don't move. I meant to tell a story, and I didn't write it in my notes, and I was reminded of it. Bob and I was talking the other day, and uh, he was telling me the story about living on a farm where he, where, where, well, where they live now, and some old guy came by there that had used to live there years and years ago. He said the guy was about 80s, and this has been a long time ago, so he's probably gone. And the old guy was talking. He wanted to go around and walk around the property, and Bob didn't care. Bob was mowing grass. And the guy come back and said, yeah, there used to be a well around here. And Bob said, well, that's the well we got over here. And uh, the old guy started telling this story. He said, yeah, I was digging. We was digging this well. And he said, we got down in there. And when we got down to the water, the water started coming in so fast we had to get out of it. And praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. So they had, he had to get out of the well. And uh, he said we was looking over in there, and while I was looking, he said, I had a pair of glasses that fell out of my pocket into that well. Well, Bob and his family had to redig that well when they moved on their property and built their house. They was hoping to hit another spot, and they didn't, so they had to use that well. So when they redug that well, they hauled all that junk that's in the bottom of the well out, the dead rats and you know, all those things that you really want to get out of you. How many of you don't want dead rats in your well, okay? So you're getting all that stuff up out of the bottom of the well, you know, and it's all this junk, and you get buckets of it, and you're dumping it out there and everything. Well, Bob tells me that after they did that, that he went out a couple of days later, and it had all dried out, and he was kicking, he was picking it up and carrying it away. He was kicking it around, and in that pile of stuff, he found a glasses case, and in that glasses case was a pair of glasses. And he kept them. So he told that old man, hang on a second. Went in the house and came back out with the old man's glasses, and the old man got to crying, almost cried. Now, that's an amazing story in itself, amen? But I think maybe if we would get down and dig a little deeper, we'd see a little better what it is that God wants us to see, Amen. Maybe we'd get the vision, hallelujah, of what God has for us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for everybody in here. Go with them, be with them, bless them. Let them get their feet wet today, Lord, in the well. And we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.